Thanks for all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us this morning. Um, as the Dean acknowledged, we have a, a very diverse group and among the people here are people from the medical school, the social work school, and the nursing school. Now, I'm going to have to ask my colleagues from the other disciplines to excuse me for a moment because I'm going to begin by talking about tort law because after all, I am a person of the law and a, specifically a person of tort law. But I promise that I'll bring it around a little bit later to talking about the social problem of mass shootings and we can talk about it then. Now, for those of you who are legally trained or in the process of becoming legally trained, when most of you were thinking about coming to law school or most of you were starting law school, if you had a public interest bent, you probably did not think about tort law as being at the center of your interest. You were probably more interested in things like constitutional law or employment discrimination. You certainly didn't come to law school because you fell asleep watching a movie, woke up at 1 o'clock in the morning and saw the ads on the television. If you've got a phone, you've got a lawyer, call 1-800-DOGBITE. <laughs> However, it is possible and likely, I think, that during the next year, a recent decision from the Connecticut Supreme Court Soto versus Bushmaster will play a role in the 2020 presidential and congressional elections. Now, I'm sure you recall the grisly facts of the massacre that led to the litigation. This were the Sandy Hook shootings. The assailant shot 20 first grade school children and six adults, teachers and staff, using a semi-automatic weapon that accommodated large magazines. His mother had bought the gun and given it, to, given it to him when he was 17 years old as a gift because he aspired for a career in the military. The weapon was designed and based on the military AR-15s used in all of our recent wars. The bullets in those guns are fired at such high velocity that when they impact human flesh, they create shock waves that pass through the victim's body, resulting in catastrophic injuries, even in parts of the body remote from the initial entry wound. They're designed, quite frankly, so that once somebody is hit by a bullet on the battlefield, that they don't get up and resume the fight. This young man, 20 at the time of the shooting, fired 154 rounds in four and a half minutes. In Soto versus Bushmaster, the Connecticut Supreme Court held that some of the parents of the 20 children who were killed, as well as the representatives of the six adults killed, have a potentially viable claim based upon tort law seeking damages against the sellers of the semi-automatic weapons used by the shooter. This is true, according to the court, despite the fact that there is a congressional statute, something called the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act, which appears at first look to preclude such an action. Now, seven weeks ago, on August 1st to be exact, the defendant firearm distributors filed a petition for writ of certiorari with the United States Supreme Court, asking the Supreme Court to construe that statute in a way that would preclude this tort action. It is probable, I think, that the Supreme Court will hear the case and issue a decision quite possibly in the months preceding the presidential election. Now, tort actions have always involved the public interest. Think, for example, one example, in the 19, late 1970s, 1980s, when the Ford Pinto was uh, a car, very popular car, manufactured by Ford at that time, had a defectively designed gas tank. So when the car was rear-ended at 15 or 20 miles an hour, the car would become a bomb and would explode, most often incinerating the passengers and the drivers. 
the decisions, the common law tort decisions against Ford arising from those incidents resulted in the recall of all of the Ford Pintos that were still out there, hundreds of thousands. But the filing of tort actions with an explicitly public interest or political agenda is, for the most part, a more recent phenomenon. In the mid-1990s, states filed actions against tobacco manufacturers, ultimately resulting in a $250 billion settlement. In the years that followed, states and municipalities sued, among others, emitters of greenhouse gases, lead pigment manufacturers, and now, of course, opiate manufacturers. Now, several legal and non-legal factors account for the emergence of these new types of tort actions. First, tort law increasingly call, involves what I call and what other tort scholars referred to as enabling defendants. Quite often in the real world, the tort feeser whose actions are most directly connected with the victim's harm. For example, the intoxicated driver who strikes and injures or kills somebody, or the criminal assaulting a resident of an apartment complex, are largely judgment-proof or even unidentified. However, courts, even in Maryland, generally not known for expansive liability, now hold other parties whose tortious conduct contributed to the victim harm such as the social host who served the alcohol to the minor that then caused the fatal accident, or the operator of the apartment complex whose negligence enabled the assailant to access a young woman's apartment. The second factor, legal factor, is that plaintiffs in many of these new cases are increasingly collective entities suing to collect damages suffered at least initially, not by themselves, but instead by a multitude of individual victims. For example, states and municipalities have sued to recover losses that they have sustained as a result of Medicaid payments to victims of tobacco-related diseases. The third factor that I think accounts for this new form of a tort action is more political than legal. In our time, progressives and others are understandably frustrated with the increasing unwillingness of administrative agencies and legislatures to deal, to effectively regulate antisocial conduct on an ex-ante basis. And so they turn to tort law. Think about the tort actions against utility companies and other corporations emitting greenhouse gases. Yet even with the emergence of these new public interest tort actions against product manufacturers and polluters, a tort action against gun manufacturers seemed impossible. Why? Because during the late 1990s, there had been a handful of successful actions against gun manufacturers. But as a result, in 2005, Congress passed something called the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. This act, with a few exceptions, immunized firearm manufacturers, distributors, and dealers from civil liability for crimes committed by third parties using their weapons. Uh, as everybody, all the legally trained people know, the legislative branch can always trump the common law, no pun intended. Now, one of the reasons that I, one of the reasons that I loved adding the teaching of Soto versus Bushmaster to my advanced torts class last spring, only a couple of weeks after the case had been decided, and one of the reasons I look forward to teaching it again in my products liability course this spring, is that a lawyer meeting for the first time with representative parents of those killed children would have had to have said to them, I'm really sorry, but Congress has passed this statute that says that firearm manufacturers 
cannot be sued in this situation. And, as would have been expected, the Connecticut trial court dismissed all of the traditional products liability claims filed by the parents against the gun manufacturers because of the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. That brings us, bizarrely enough, to something called the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act, often referred to by its less than melodious acronym, CUTPA. This is far from a unique statute. Every state has a similar act with variations among the statutes. The acts typically target deceptive or fraudulent practices that cause financial harm to the consumer. Things like false advertising, bait and switch, and the like. They generally give the state attorney general the primary role for enforcing their act, the act, but individual consumers also have private causes of action for the financial losses that they sustain. Now, beginning in the early uh, years of this century, maybe in the last decade of the 20th century, when plaintiff's lawyers filed mass products towards claims against manufacturers, they would typically list 15, 20, 25 different claims or causes of action. Remember, you don't have to just choose a writ in modern day practice. And the claim for Unfair Trade Practices Act violation was usually among the last three or four of the claims that were listed. Why? Because even the plaintiff's attorneys were implicitly acknowledging that their claims were hopeless, that their claims were hopeless. Now, obviously, there were difficulties with such a claim, including most relevantly, first, that unfair trade practices acts were designed to protect consumers from financial harm, not from harm, bodily injury, or death. In Soto versus Bushmaster, however, the Connecticut Supreme Court held two things that are virtually unprecedented. First, those who were physically injured by products even if they were not the original purchaser of the product, even if they were not a user of the product, had standing under the Unfair Trade Practices Act to sue the sellers and distributors of firearms for harms that they sustained as a result of violations of the Unfair Trade Practices Act. Second, damages for the death of a child traditionally personal injury, wrongful death type damages were recoverable under the act. Recoverable damages were no longer limited to financial losses experienced by the consumer. So it is critical to understand that in Soto, defended firearm manufacturers were not being held liable, bear with me here, strictly for the manufacturer in the sale of the semi-automatic weapon, these semi-automatic weapons that were originally based on the military AR-15s. Um, the plaintiffs in this case originally filed a claim that said the manufacturing distribution of, of the semi-automatic weapons violated the Unfair Trade Practices Act. That was dismissed by the court, but one claim remained. Instead, the distributors were held liable for promoting and advertising these semi-automatic weapons to members of the general public as assault weapons for offensive military-style missions. Broadcast internet print ads for the semi-automatic weapons that killed the first graders at Sandy Hook showed things like a close-up of an AR-15 with the following slogan, forces of opposition bow down. You are single-handedly outnumbered. Similar slogans advertise the unparalleled destructive capacity of the AR-15 for military missions. The Connecticut Supreme Court concluded that the defendants advertised and promoted the AR-15 in an unethical, oppressive, immoral, 
and unscrupulous manner, and that those ads encouraged illegal and unsafe behavior, thus violating the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act. The court bluntly stated, quote, Connecticut law does not permit advertisements that promote or encourage violent criminal behavior. The court noted that the Federal Trade Commission, pursuing objectives similar to those of the Unfair Trade Practices Act, had frequently taken enforcement action against unsafe products that injured children who were not direct consumers. On the standing issue, that is, could non-consumers sue under the Unfair Trade Practices Act, the Connecticut Supreme Court engaged in statutory interpretation, obviously. The court concluded that personal injury damages are among the type of damages that would satisfy the statutory language of any ascertainable loss of money. Now, this is, depending on your point of view, either a desirable expansion of liability under the Unfair Trade Practices Act or a stretch in interpreting statutory interpretation. Now, once the court had decided that non-consumers could recover for personal injury damages under the act, the last word, the last hurdle was causation. How could plaintiffs show that the ways that the AR-15s were advertised caused the death of the students and the teachers? Remember again, the law has changed in recent decades. Even in Maryland, the intervention of criminal conduct by third parties following a defendant's negligent or otherwise tortious conduct does not necessarily preclude liability. So for example, if the owner of an apartment complex or a parking garage negligently fails to implement reasonable safety precautions, they can be held liable, even though the immediate harm was inflicted by a criminal using a handgun. So applying the same principle here, if the defendant firearm manufacturers engaged in tortious conduct, the intervening acts, I apologize to my first year students, we'll get to these terms later next month, the intervening acts of the active shooter in mowing down the first graders does not operate as a superseding cause to preclude the liability of the defendant firearm manufacturers. But what exactly was the conduct of the firearm manufacturers who violated the Unfair Trade Practices Act that constituted a factual cause under Connecticut law, a substantial factor in causing the 26 deaths? In its opinion, the Connecticut Supreme Court acknowledged that it might prove to be a, quote, Herculean task for the plaintiffs to prove causation at trial. However, they identified two ways in which it might be done. First, plaintiff might be able to prove that the defendant's advertising and marketing, you remember, quote, mow down your opponents, caused the perpetrator to select a weapon that greatly increased the extent of the massacre. And second, the effect of the defendant's advertising on the perpetrator, a young man and one quite probably with some mental issues, may have, in the court's words, inspired the attack. So let's pause here for a moment. There's a great deal more about this decision, but even if there were not, Soto versus Bushmaster would already be a critical case, at least for a torts professor. Perhaps only one other state Supreme Court opinion had held that a state unfair trade practice act provides a private cause of action for a non-consumer injured by a product or injured by the seller's deceptive advertising. State Supreme Courts obviously have the last word on interpretations of Unfair Trade Practices Act. These are state statutes. Everything that we've talked about so far cannot be reversed by the United States Supreme Court despite its widely acknowledged conservative bent.
So regardless of what happens with the issues that we're about to talk about, Soto versus Bushmaster appears likely to be a note case or even a principal case in future products liability casebooks and perhaps even torts casebooks. Already after this decision, the strongest claim being pursued by the city of Baltimore against opiate manufacturers rests on Maryland's Unfair Trade Practices Act. But now we turn our attention to whether or not the parents' action against Bushmaster and Bushmaster has now been absorbed into Remington is precluded by the Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. As stated previously, this act, with a few exceptions, immunizes firearm manufacturers, distributors, dealers from civil liability for crimes committed by third parties using their weapons. The act, however, does include several exceptions to this immunity, the most important of which, and the one most relevant here, is the so-called predicate exception. The predicate exception to the immunity of firearm manufacturers applies when the manufacturer or seller of a firearm knowingly violates a pre-existing, that means that existed before the Congressional Act, state or federal act applicable, there's the key word, applicable to the sale or marketing of the firearm. The majority concludes, looking at the experience of sister states, that the regulation of firearms advertising has long been accomplished by applying state consumer protection and unfair trade practices statutes. Therefore, according to the majority, the Unfair Trade Practices Act qualifies as predicate exceptions to the immunity granted gun manufacturers by the federal statute. Now, three members of the seven-member Supreme Court, Connecticut Supreme Court, dissented solely on this issue. The dissent concludes, and this is also the focus of the defendant's petition for certiorari, that the so-called predicate exception to the immunity under the act applies only to those statutes that govern the sale and marketing of firearms specifically, as contrasted with generalized unfair trade practices statutes that govern a wide array of commercial activities. As Justice Robinson dissenting in the opinion pointed out, the legislative history of the federal statute illustrates the congressional intent was specifically to shield gun manufacturers from, quote, novel or vague standards of liability. I hate to admit this because my heart is totally in line with those of the parents of the dead children, the plaintiffs, but Justice Robinson may have the better argument. I think it's difficult to argue convincingly that the predicate exception was not designed to prevent liability based upon a new and novel interpretation of an Unfair Trade Practices Act that enabled a third party to recover for personal injury damage instead of financial damages. They did so under a pre-existing statute, but one that had never been applied in this way before. It seems clear, as the defendants note in their cert petition, that if the Connecticut Supreme Court's decision stands, that's, that some or most of the many other 49 states would soon be allowing victims of mass shootings involving semi-automatic weapons to sue and recover under their parallel Unfair Trade Practices Act. Now, wherever you stand on the ultimate issue here, I think you need to recognize that liability of gun manufacturers for mass shootings in, uh, caused by their weapons would probably result in either the elimination of those weapons from the public market or uh, being sold far more carefully or a dramatic increase in price. The deadline for the parents, the plaintiff respondents brief in opposition to the granting of cert 
has been extended until early next month. I believe it's October 4th, so stay tuned. Now, obviously, the liability of manufacturers and sellers of semi-automatic weapons that are used to kill children is a political as well as a legal decision. So here is the choice that members of the United States Supreme Court will have on whether or not to grant certiorari in this case. Imagine if four of the more conservative members of the court vote to grant certiorari. The case could well be heard and decided sometime before July of next year, a few months before the presidential and the congressional elections. Now, both gun rights and the control of the courts traditionally have been important, favorable issues for Republican candidates, but not for Democratic candidates. But imagine the Democratic campaign issues focusing on the courts and the Sandy Hook children, never mind reproductive freedoms and some of the alleged conduct of the court's newest member. Now, having said that, I think it's plausible but unlikely that the court would decide to deny cert. If that occurs, of course, the case would proceed through discovery. It's currently, uh, 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 there's, the litigation has currently been stayed, but it would then proceed through discovery, pretrial motions, and eventually trial. My uneducated guess would be that it, it would be unlikely that the case would come to trial before November 2020. Nevertheless, it's probable that discovery and motion hearings in the case would receive a fair amount of press attention in the months preceding the election. Presumably, pro-gun candidates would not welcome renewed press attention about the mowing down of 20 first graders and their teachers. And if the court does not accept cert, imagine the pressure on the new Congress that a trial in this case would generate if it occurs during 2021 or 2022. So it's going to be an interesting year in the world of torts. And we barely mentioned the opiate litigation, which is actually one of the things that our entering students discussed during orientation. So my conclusion for you today is that these days, tort law is a whole lot more interesting than auto accidents and slip and fall cases. But perhaps, and perhaps even more interesting than the scales toppling on poor old Mrs. Polsgraf. So thank you, and I think we're going to have questions and discussion, right? All right. Who has a question?